The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship with First Presbyterian Church on this Lord's Day, the fourth Sunday of Advent. The name Advent means coming or arrival. The season of Advent is a season of preparation, preparation for the coming Christ. And in order to help us build anticipation and expectation, we have the lighting of our Advent candles. And lighting our candles this morning are our three confirmands, Morgan Graham, Lucy Colmer, and Wills Panair. Please join us in the responsive candle lighting liturgy. We light these candles as a sign of the coming light of Christ. Advent means coming. We are preparing for ourselves for the days when the nations shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and, the, and a little child shall lead them. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad, the desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The Lord will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. God is with us. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us pray. God of grace, ever faithful to your promises, the earth rejoices in the hope of our Savior's coming and looks forward with longing to his return at the end of time. Prepare our hearts to receive him when he comes. For he is Lord forever and ever. Amen. Our first hymn is another opportunity for sacred dance. So if you're at home watching, why don't you stand up and dance around with us as we uh, awake, awake, and greet the new morn together. Awake and greet the new morn, for angels herald its dawning. Sing out your joy, for soon he is born. Behold the child of our longing. Come as a baby, weak and poor, to bring all hearts together. He opens wide the heavenly door and lives now inside us forever. To us, to all, in sorrow and fear, Emmanuel comes a singing. His humble song is quiet and neat, yet fills the earth with its ringing. Music to heal the broken soul and hymns of loving kindness. The thunder of his anthem rolls to shatter all hatred and violence. It is easy, as Jesus puts it when he visited Martha and Mary, to be worried and distracted by many things. But in this time of worship, we are invited to sit in the presence of Christ 
and to listen for what he might be saying to us. And so in this, let us use this time of confession to recenter our thoughts and refocus our minds so that we might attend to the one thing needed. Let us pray together. Merciful God, always with us, always coming, we confess that we do not know how to prepare for your advent. We have forgotten how to hope in miracles. We have ignored the promise of your kingdom. We get distracted by all the busyness of this season. Forgive us. Grant us the simple wonder of the shepherds, the intelligent courage of the magi, and the patient faith of Mary and Joseph, that we may journey with them to Bethlehem and find the good news of a child born for us. Now, in the quiet of our hearts, we ask you to make us ready for his coming. Thank you, Lord, for peace and stillness in which we discover your presence anew. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Whether we are ready or not, Christ is coming into the world to meet us where we are. No matter the state of our hearts, we are loved and welcomed by God. So may you receive this love and know that you are forgiven. Come, come, Emmanuel, Son of God, appear. Heaven and earth rejoice, salvation is drawing near, salvation is drawing near. Come, come, Emmanuel, Son of God, appear. Heaven and earth rejoice, salvation is drawing near, salvation is drawing near. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us share the peace with one another from a safe distance. Well, we are in this season of waiting called Advent, and our three confirmands, whom you see here, have been waiting a long time for this day, the completion of their confirmation journey. It was a year ago this month, last December, when they started the confirmation process uh, with Pastor Eric, and Pastor Eric worked with them in the months that followed, they met almost weekly. They worked through a study guide. They studied the profession of faith questions together, learned about the history of the faith a bit, visited some other worship services, worship services uh, with other uh, faith communities. And finally, in the spring, came before the session and professed their faith. And the session received them uh, into membership uh, pending the completion of the confirmation process in worship. And then, of course, things happened and have continued to happen, and so uh, this day got delayed until now. But what a joy it is to finally arrive at this moment and to uh, introduce to you 
our three confirmands as new members of our church pending uh, Wills' baptism here in a moment. Uh, Lucy Colmer, Morgan Graham, and William Baird Panair. Oh, and one more thing that's pretty cool about these three. They are all part of three-generation church families. Uh, so each of them are grandchildren of grandparents who are members and children of parents who are members of our church family. Margaret? Siblings in Christ, you have come to declare publicly the Christian faith and your decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so it is my privilege to ask you the following three questions. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Do you? And will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and are joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Today, Lucy and Morgan have publicly claimed for themselves the faith that was professed on their behalf at the time of their baptisms. And we also have the added privilege of celebrating the sacrament itself with Wills, who is professing the faith on his own behalf at the time of his baptism. And so, as we turn towards the sacrament, let us hear these words from Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And from Ephesians, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And so it is in, it is in obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises that we baptize those whom God has called. Let us remember again with joy our own baptisms as we celebrate this sacrament. Through baptism, Wills becomes part of our family. And as family, we share responsibility for one another. And so just as we do with every baptism, we welcome these new family members by making a vow to love and care for them. And so I invite you to make that vow again for Wills. Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Wills by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging him to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of his church? Do you? Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks, for you nourish and sustain all living things by the gift of water. In the beginning of time, your spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling forth order and life. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil by the waters of the flood, giving righteousness a new beginning. You led Israel out of slavery through the waters of the sea into the freedom of the promised land. In the waters of Jordan, Jesus was baptized by John and anointed with your spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, Christ set us free 
from sin and death and open the way to eternal life. We thank you, O God, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. From it, we are raised to share in his resurrection. Through it, we are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. Send your spirit to move over this water that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Wash away the sin of all who are cleansed by it, raise them to new life, and graft them to the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon them, that they may have power to do your will, and continue forever in the risen life of Christ. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, be all praise, honor, and glory now and forever. Amen. William Baird Panair, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, bless and keep this your child. Amen. Wills, welcome to the family. And Margaret has... Yeah, we can applaud. Can Yay. <laughs> Yay. And Margaret has uh, a commissioning prayer for all three of you. Yes. Yes, let us pray now for Wills and also for Morgan and Lucy. Gracious God, by water and the Spirit, you claimed us as your own, cleansing us from sin and giving us new life. You made us members of your body, the church, calling us to be your servants in the world. Renew in these youth the covenant you make in their baptism. Continue the good work you have begun in them. Send them forth in the power of your spirit to love and serve you with joy and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. O Lord, we ask that you would uphold these children of yours by the Holy Spirit. Give them the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. And stay right there. I have a gift for each of you. <laughs> As you might know, I collect crosses from around the world, and there are a bunch of them on my wall, but there are three fewer this morning because I am gifting each of you a cross from a different part of the world. We've just uh, welcomed you into membership, not only of this church, but also of the church universal, the global church, the church worldwide. Wills, I have a cross for you from Mexico. Morgan, a cross for you from India. And Lucy, a cross for you from Italy. To remind you of your new, big, extended family, a global community of faith. Welcome and congratulations. Our second pandemic baptism and a little awkward but still a joy and wills you got off easy i usually use more water than that <laughs> but don't worry the holy spirit can work with any amount of water as we prepare to hear the good news let us pray light of the world shine in our darkness amen Advent is the beginning of the Christian year. So it's curious that the lectionary's epistle readings these past two Sundays have been the endings of two epistles. Last week, we heard the ending of 1 Thessalonians, Paul's first letter. 
And this week, we're hearing Paul's letter to Jesus' followers in Rome. Romans is a later letter. Last week, we heard Paul end with words of exhortation and words of encouragement. This week, he ends by dropping names, a lot of names. This name dropping might not make for exciting reading, but make no mistake, there is much to be learned from Paul's closing words to the church in Rome. Long list of names and all. Today's ending begins with Romans chapter 16, verse 1. Paul writes, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at Sencre, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints, and help her in whatever she may require from you. For she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. Greet Prissa and Aquila, who work with me in Christ Jesus, and who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Eponidas, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard among you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who were in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my relative, Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. And greet his mother, a mother to me also. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to keep an eye on those who cause dissensions and offenses in opposition to the teaching that you have learned. Avoid them. For such people do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the hearts of the simple-minded. For while your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, I want you to be wise in what is good and guileless in what is evil. The God of peace will shortly crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, my co-worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my relatives. I, Tertius, the writer of this letter, greet you in the Lord. Paul dictated this letter to Tertius. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus greet you. Now, to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, through 
Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. That's a lot of names. What kind of way is that to end what is widely regarded as Paul's magnum opus? Romans, with its richly dense theology, is commonly considered Paul's most important work. I once saw a poll of clergy that asked, if you were stranded on an uninhabited island and could only have one book of the Bible, which would it be? Romans 1, beating out even the Gospels, the biographies of Jesus. Yet, this undeniably important work ends with a list that is an arguably anticlimactic conclusion. As we hear names listed, one after another, verse after verse, our eyes might glaze over. But that would be our loss. Lists of names are common in the Bible. As early as the fifth chapter of Genesis, we find a lengthy list of names, a genealogy that begins with Adam and ends with the sons of Noah. And the New Testament opens with a genealogy. Before telling the story of the birth of Jesus, the Gospel of Matthew lists the Messiah's ancestors, beginning with Abraham and continuing through Joseph. That might seem like a strange way to start the greatest story ever told. I mean, it's a bit boring when compared with the Gospel of John's opening. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Names or incarnation, how best to begin the story of Jesus? The answer seems obvious to me. Still, it would be a mistake to dismiss Matthew's opening. There is meaning to be gleaned from his list of names. It should not be lost on us, for example, that Matthew includes in Jesus' genealogy multiple women, which was not the norm for genealogies in the patriarchal first century world. Where did Matthew get the idea to include women? Well, Matthew might have gotten this idea from Paul. You see, the scholarly consensus is that Paul wrote before the Gospel of Matthew was written. Paul's letter to the church in Rome was circulating for a decade or two before the writing of Matthew. Perhaps Matthew was inspired to begin with a list of names by the list of names that ends Romans. In any case, these lists have in common the inclusion of women. And Paul does more than sprinkle in the names of a few women without comment. Paul commends several women for their work, in particular leading and teaching in the church. Phoebe, Prissa, Mary, Junia, Tryphena and Tryphosa, the mother of Rufus, Julia, and more are listed here. One-third of the 29 followers of Jesus mentioned here are women. Moreover, some of these women were in the highest positions in church leadership. Phoebe was a deacon. We Presbyterians ordain deacons no less than we do clergy or elders. Prissa was a church planter and teacher. Junia was counted among the apostles. 
you don't get more prominent than the apostles. Now, you might be asking, why then do some churches not teach and practice gender equality and have women in leadership? Well, it seems that, like some later New Testament writings, they have regressed, falling into patriarchal notions and ways that predate Christianity. I'm sure that Presbyterians also get some things wrong. But we're right about gender equality. In addition to teaching us something about gender equality, this long list of names teaches us something about diversity. Throughout the New Testament, we find evidence that the early church was a Jewish movement that moved away from ethnocentrism and nationalism. In his earlier letter to Jesus' followers in the region of Galatia, Paul rails against ethnic boundary markers like circumcision and dietary regulations. He's not opposed to these things. He just wants different ethnic groups to move beyond them in order to be one community in Christ. Here in Romans, Paul shows the early church's multi-ethnic and international identity by including Jewish names and Greek names and Latin names. The church in Rome is attempting to live out what angels sang to shepherds outside of Bethlehem decades earlier. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace, goodwill among people. One New Testament scholar comments, despite names otherwise unknown to us, the list is a valuable cross-section of early Roman Christianity and is evidence of unity within a remarkable diversity in the Roman church. Finally, I would be remiss not to point out that the last name Paul lists is the name of Jesus. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Elsewhere, Paul writes, God gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Yet, Jesus is not so far above us that he overlooks us. The one whose name is above all names knows our names. He knows your name. Know that you are known and be at peace. Let us affirm our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed, which Christians have been proclaiming together for nearly 16 and a half centuries. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God 
from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our second hymn, the melody, was written in the fourth century. It's been around and a popular one for a long time. I'm going to lay it out for you on the recorder so that you'll have something to hum while I'm singing. The Father's love begotten, ere the worlds began to be. He is Alpha and Omega, He the source, the ending He. Of the things that are, that have been, and that future years shall see evermore and evermore. O ye heights of heaven, adore him. Angel hosts his praises sing. Powers, dominions bow before him and extol our God and King. Let no tongue on earth be silent. Every voice in concert ring evermore and evermore. one of my favorites. Yes. As we continue to reflect on the word we hear this morning and the message of Christ we have received, we look ahead to our the week before us and the months as well um, and consider the ways that we might live out our calling to respond. And as part of that, we share in life together here at First Presbyterian Church. 
and I would direct your attention to the calendar that appears at the end of the bulletin today, um, that you might see the ways that we are gathering in the coming week ahead um, to share in faith together and to grow in service to our world. Um, I would draw your attention to just a few things. First, our Lectio Divina Bible study will be on Wednesday morning at 9.30 a.m., and I believe that will be our last Bible study of the year. We won't be leading the following week. So if you would like to participate, um, the link will be coming out via your email, so keep an eye out for that. We also, also on Wednesday, we have um, our open sanctuary, so you are welcome to come and be in this space quietly. Um, and it will be Christmas Eve Eve, and though we won't be gathering in person on Christmas Eve, um, that might be an opportunity for you to come and be in the worship space together. Um, we also have a few social groups that are meeting. We have two on Sundays and one on Thursday. We have our coffee hour, a virtual coffee hour that gathers at 1130 and Needles Craft Group, which I believe gathers at four o'clock on Sundays. And on Thursdays at five o'clock, we have a social gathering as well, although I'm not positive if they will be, that group will be gathering this week since that is Christmas Eve. Speaking of Christmas Eve, uh, we will be having worship on Thursday at seven o'clock. It will be live streamed and we hope you will join us. And though we will not be gathering in person for worship in the sanctuary, for those who are interested, the worship music, worship ministry team is planning an option um, for people to gather in the parking lot to watch the live stream together on your personal devices from the safety of your own cars. It's a creative way that we could be in one another's presence as we celebrate Christ's arrival together, but yet also safe as we stay in our the bubbles of our own vehicles. We do ask that people stay in their cars and try to park in alternating spaces, uh, but the worship team will be distributing communion elements and a glow stick, uh, which can be activated during the singing of Silent Night as a reminder of the light of Christ, both as we are together and, well, I guess, as we are near one another um, and as we return to our homes. Whether you join us in the parking lot or from your own home, uh, we look forward to the time together and hope that you will join us. The week following Christmas will be somewhat quiet. Um, there will be no study groups or open sanctuary. Um, I'm not sure if the social groups plan to meet or not. Um, and unlike in previous years, um, the office will not be open on December 31st to receive any end of year gifts. However, you can make a gift online at any time, and checks that are any checks that are received shortly after the beginning of the new year that have a date in December will be counted as 2020 donations. Finally, uh, this is the last week to add your prayers to our Advent prayer tree, which is still down in by the church sign at the Main Street parking lot entrance. Um, our original box of ribbons disappeared, but they have been replenished, so there are plenty for you to use. And the tree is looking pretty festive as it takes on more and more of our prayers, and um, we'd love to see it completely covered by Christmas Eve. So do stop by and add some of your own. And speaking of prayer, let us approach the throne of grace in prayer. Gracious God, amid the lights, exciting packages, high hopes, and heightened generosity of this Christmas season, keep us steadily mindful of the humble stable and its precious resident, of humdrum Nazareth, and its maturing child, of welcoming Galilee, amazed Decapolis, hostile Jerusalem, of hideous cross and open tomb, and of the marvelous Savior and Lord emerging, through whom down through the centuries, humans have found light everlasting, power sufficient, 
and joy beyond equal. Mighty and merciful God, here we are caught up in the swirl of Christmas. Gifts, cards, food, decorations, and virtual gatherings. Give us your peace. Here we are tense in our relationships with one another, with parents, with spouses, with children, with employees, with customers. Give us your peace. Here we are, confused in values, perplexed in goals, poignant in reflection. Give us your peace. And help us to see anew that our chief end is to glorify you, to love you with heart and mind and soul and strength, and to love one another for your sake. We pray especially for those in need, whether of comfort or healing or strength or peace. We pray for Jeff Scott, for Rick Van Hoos, for Jean Windsor and her daughter and her family, for Dave Ricks, for Mary Ann Glover, for Colleen Otten, for Julie Seach. Bless and keep these your people. Make your face to shine upon them. Be kind and gracious to them and grant them your peace. And to these names, we add additional names in the silence. Praise to you, O Lord, for your mercy and patience, for your loving presence and your healing power. Catching our breath and opening our hearts, we pray to you as Jesus taught disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture text that Josh illuminated for us this morning named a great deal of people who served in ministry with Paul to help build up the church and the community of faith. They contributed in a variety of ways, and so can we. So let us consider the variety of ways that God is calling us to participate in Christ's ongoing work at this time and commit ourselves to that path with generosity and hope. Let us pray. God of abundance and joy, we are grateful for the gift of the Christian community, past, present, and future, and for the ways you have blessed us through the gifts we have in one another. Help us to appreciate all that we have and all that we have received so that we too might share joyfully of our own gifts for the ongoing flourishing of your people and your world. In gratitude, we pray. Amen. Angels we have heard on high sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains. 
Now may the love of God, the light of Christ, and the life of the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you now and forevermore. Amen.